Father, Lord, we want to thank you for the opportunity to worship and to sing and to praise and to exalt your holy name. I pray, Lord, our joy, our thanksgiving will not turn to ashes in the name of Jesus. Stones will not take our place. They will not take our position. Everything, Lord, that is a limiter of praise and of thanksgiving, take away from us in the name of Jesus. I will pray, Lord, as we share your word, Lord, you circumcise our hearts to hear, to speak, to understand, and to apply in the name of Jesus. For those of us who are here and those who have joined online, wheresoever they may be on the surface of the earth, ask, Lord, that the word will mix with faith and profit everyone in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, because we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. As you know, this length season, for those of you who have been following the midweek services, the theme is give up or giving up for Christ. And on Wednesday, we shared on giving up selfishness. And I just thought that given the season, we should remind ourselves of some other components of things that we needed to give up. And the Lord will help us as we share today in the name of Jesus. Today, we're looking at one of the characters around Jesus who played a major role in Jesus achieving his destiny, but someone often not too deeply discussed because all of us know what he did and we condemn it. And that is Judas Iscariot. To the extent that I found very few people globally who have chosen to name their children Judas. Praise the Lord. You know, there are some names that people tactfully avoid. There are some places where people still name uh, children Judas. Judas is actually the Greek format of Judah. And Judah is a beloved name. Okay? The, the lawgiver. The one through whom Jesus came. But Judas, the Greek rendering of it, everybody stays away from. Judas, as we know, is one of the disciples of Jesus mentioned in the three synoptic gospels. In fact, the three of them name him last, which is rather another indication of the fact that they would have confined him to a footnote if it was possible. But they named him last. He was named last. If you check the three synoptic gospels, you'll find that his name last. I choose to use Luke chapter 6 from 12 to 16. NIV. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. And he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Verse 14. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So who was Judas? We're going to consider Judas from three characteristics. First, Judas, the treasurer and thief. I pray you will not be branded a thief in the name of Jesus. But if you don't want to be branded a thief, you must not steal. Praise the Lord. John 12, 1 to 6. Six days, John 12, 1 to 6. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. 
you would have thought that this is righteous indignation. We are wasting money. But the Bible says he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So, the first thing is that Judas was a senior officer in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And apart from the disciples, there were the twelve. And even amongst the twelve, he was given a special position. He was doubly special. He was appointed treasurer. But we're told, as we read in the scripture, he was a hypocrite and a thief. He was stealing the offering. Hypocrite because he pretended to love the poor. Whereas, in fact, he wanted more money to be put in the offering bag so that he would have a bigger pot from which to steal from, apparently. Sometimes, no matter how important people are, no matter how important the position they occupy, with the privileges, with the honor, with the respect, when they lack character, they debase themselves and may debase that position. An apostle of the gospel stealing the money of the ministry. I think I once shared before, I was told by a friend who worships in a very big church, I won't say which church now, about a family who were a family of ushers in this very big church. And they were stealing the offering of the church. They made their own offering bag. They sold their own usher's uniform. Because of stealing, the church sold uniforms for ushers who collect offering. And they would change it. But they were so well positioned, they knew the array of uniforms that had been prepared. So they prepared for every member of the family. And so every big service where you have thousands of people, they will position themselves and the offering bag will just move from the church to their vehicle. The family eventually faced disaster. What happened, as I was told, was the head of the church, somebody sued into the ministry and it was in U.S. dollars. And the person went to him just before service to say, Brother, so 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 in so 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 country said I should give this money to you. And he brought it in a unique kind of envelope. And it was full of dollars. So rather than the man taking it, he said, No, put it in the offering bag. So he didn't take it in his office. He said, Just put it in the offering bag. We will bless everything together. And then after they finished the service and counted the money, this special envelope was not to be found. It had been stolen by people. Who say, Obaton Jafun me? Oh, thank you for fighting my battles for me. Jehovah, oh, Lubeja. The family was eventually found out. The man I was told died. Terrible things happened. When you are stealing like that, what do you expect to happen? I was told by a friend of mine just recently that there are churches where some people go to Bible school. And then they say they have become pastor. And then somebody will give them money to go and start a church. And it's a business, so when they collect offering, you'll be paying back. Have you heard of that kind of thing before? If you have heard of it, raise your hand. I've not seen any. If you have heard of it, brother, are you raising your hand? Good. You validate my brother's position. Because I said, how, when will it end? That sort of thing. What was the main character deficiency of Judas? It was the love of money. For some of us, it may be love of something else. Jewelry, power, position, food, like Esau, who loved food so much, he traded away the birthright. Sex, pleasure. Some people, it's just visibility. They want to be the one in front. They just want to be seen. Something so dear that it leads us to temptation. And the Bible warns us about those things. First Timothy 6. Very popular scripture. 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 10. I'm reading from NIV. He says, those who want to... What does he say? I can't hear you. Now, aspiration and ambition to be rich, there's nothing wrong with it. What is wrong is further down. We will get there. He says, those who want to get rich. Because the system is designed not to make you get rich. The system is designed to actually slow down wealth. 
except you stand out, you do something extraordinary. And when you look at all the wealthy people, at least, you find something unique, some insight, inspiration that they have been blessed with that catapulted them into wealth. So he says, those who want to get rich fall into what? I can't hear you. Temptation and a what? And a trap. And into many what? Foolish and harmful desires. Because to get rich quickly, you have to manipulate. That plunge people into ruin and destruction. Verse 10. For the, together, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. Because you cannot stay within the faith where you are reminded every day not to be a Judas, not to be selfish, not to love money, and you go overboard. He says they pierce themselves with many griefs. They pierce themselves with many griefs. Judas loved money much more than he loved Jesus, or than he loved salvation. Let's compare Judas to Simon the sorcerer that we read of in Acts 8, 9-24. I'm not going to read it again. It's one of the scriptures. But let's just take what happened. Before Philip arrived in Samaria, Simon the sorcerer dominated the environment. He bewitched the people and his spell worked. He made a lot of money from them. Sometimes all it takes for spell to work on you is for you to be unnecessarily fearful. Somebody says they want to pray for you. They say you have some problem. Who doesn't have problem? Say, okay, I see you have some problem. What are you telling me that is, not, that is new? Everybody has a problem. Everybody has a problem. So when you say, oh, oh God, you have some problem. I say, don't you have some problem, uh, Pastor? I'm sure you have some problems too. We both have problems. Okay? So, his spell worked. Whatever he told them, they did it. He was a false prophet using magic and the occult to fool people. But he was making a lot of money. When the gospel came, the light of the gospel, it dispelled the darkness that he had created in the environment. People who heard the gospel, they gave their lives to Jesus. They believed in Philip. And so this man also gave his life to Christ. He gave his life to Christ, Simon the sorcerer. And he pretended to be converted. He was baptized. And he started following them all over the place. Then one day, he saw by the laying of hands, the Holy Spirit falling on people. Ah, he said, this is special. Lord. And then he got some money approach the apostles and say, please, sir, take. I, I want this power. What sort of thing? It's like you see people, sometimes they are praying for people, they lay hands on them. Some people fall down under the anointing. Then you say, oh, God, how much? Hey, go lay. Say, I want to be able to do this. Now, of course, Peter was so angry with him. He said, your heart is not. This is somebody who is following them from crusade to crusade, crusade, who had been baptized. So as we are all in church today, who knows what is inside? Some people want to buy. They want to buy spiritual gifts. They want to buy the ability to prophesy. They want to buy the ability to pray. They want to buy the ability to sing. They want to buy the ability to see visions and dream dreams. How much foolish can one get? And Peter said to Simon, he cursed him. Because you say, I can see that your heart is not right. There is jealousy and sin. The translation that we read is KJV. But if you look at um, NIV, it says there is jealousy and sin in your heart. Because, oh, these people are attracting people. They have the anointing. This spirit of competition is what leads some people to do that. So why did Jesus put a thief like Judas in charge of the offering? Didn't Jesus know that the man is a thief? Or was it because Judas had accounting skills? We're not told that Judas had accounting skills. Rather, we are told that Levi, one of the twelve, was a tax collector. So if you are looking for somebody who knows how to balance the books, who will you give the job to? You give it to Levi. You give it to Levi. But Jesus allowed this thief to be the treasurer. How many accountants are in the house? If you're an accountant, I'm not picking on you. Just raise your hand. Raise it well. Are you not proud to be an accountant? I know some accountants, if you don't raise your hand, I'll come after you. Good. 
All right. How many bankers? Let's the bankers add to the accountant. Bankers, hands up. Thank you. Auditors, join them. Raise the hand. Raise the hand. Very good. Are you raising the hand? I know some bankers, so don't let me call you. Eh? Very good. God bless you. Now, if you are managing people's money, it's not your money. Just raise your hand. You have to take decision over people's money. Thank you. Sometime last year, based on what I see in my office, I called a meeting of all the accountants in the public service. And I told them, no cobble can be stolen without your knowledge. In my office, it is not possible for me to steal money without the help of my DFA. Do you agree with me? I cannot steal without my DFA. But my DFA can steal without my help. So I told them, government money cannot be lost unless you know about it. So what are you going to do about it? You could hear a pin drop in the place. When you are in charge of money, it's a big temptation. You have to pray, God help me. This was the problem of Judas. He had access. Everybody is a potential thief. But if you are not the treasurer, you can't steal the money. Because it's not with you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, it is easy to condemn Judas. But you should ask yourself, if you are put in charge, what would you do? Judas had access. So, a lot of crimes, economic crimes, are crimes of opportunity. When you remove the opportunity, it looks as if you are a saint and that your prayers have been answered. Lord Lee does not do it. It's because you haven't seen it. To know whether or not you are disciplined, you have to be thrown in the midst of it. Say, this is money. Begin to manage. That's when you will know. It is only when you squeeze an orange that you will know what is inside it. Until you have been squeezed, you can't tell. You cannot tell. Jesus knew that Judas loved money. And just as we're talking about Judas, there are other people. There are people you give jobs to. Once you pay them, they divert the money to something else. What's the difference? It's the same thing. Whether they are contractors, consultants, whatever. You've paid them for a specific purpose. Rather than do that purpose, they put the money somewhere else. They have stolen it because they have undermined their ability to do whatever you have asked them to do. But Jesus also knew that the love of money is the root of all evil. He knew that Judas was unbelieving, but Jesus selected Judas to manage money to underscore the importance of not putting your trust in money or the treasures of the earth. I'm not praying that we should lose our investment. All of us save for a rainy day. I'm not, your, whatever you have saved will not be lost in the name of Jesus. Your labors will not be for another to eat in the name of Jesus. Your corn and your bread will not be taken by strangers in the name of Jesus. But at the end of the day, when you have done all, the best thing you can do is just stand back. There is nothing more you can do. If you have some money in the bank, you cannot call the manager every morning. Oh, guys, is my money safe? There are many things that can happen and you will not be able to control it. When the tax collectors went to meet Jesus, temple tax collector, went to meet Peter and Jesus, they said, does your master not pay tax? Did Jesus say, where is uh, Judas? Go and pay. Do you remember the story? Jesus did not call Judas. to say, treasurer, go and pay our tax. Jesus told Peter to go and catch a fish. Tell you'll find money there. God has alternative sources. During COVID-19, with all the money that we had, with people who even have visa, could anybody travel? Answer me now. We know that you see, when you sing the song, God responds in different ways. After you've done all you're supposed to do, the best you can do is just stand back and let God take charge. Because you can't tell. If there's an economic collapse, God forbid, all the investment disappears. Is that not so? Big or small. Even with this cash policy crisis, you have money in the bank, but you can't get there. You can't get there. I think that sometimes when we reflect on these things, we understand that there are other things that we can do. There are other things that we can do. And that the thing that we thought we trusted so much, it can be inaccessible when you need it the most. When you need it the most. So, 
Jesus knew that Judas was a thief, as some scriptures I will share. He knew that. He knew that the man was unbelieving. He knew he was going to betray him. Jesus didn't depend on the money that Judas was holding. And Jesus did not make a mistake. In Luke 16, one of the scriptures that we read, let's quickly go to it. We should understand that everything that we go through is a test. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. It's a character trait. There is no degree of moral brainworthiness. Somebody stole 10 naira, so you think he's better than somebody who stole 1 million. It's a question of opportunity. The moral blameworthiness is the same. So, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with the nascent words together? You are not ready, no? If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with what? So, what does Jesus mean by true riches? It's certainly not money in the bank. It is the kind of gift and wealth that nobody can buy with money. Peace of mind, for example. Contentment. Whatever your situation, it doesn't really matter. Contentment. How are you going to harass a contented person? What are you going to offer them? They're happy. They're happy. But somebody who is discontent, it doesn't matter if you roll Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Dangote, Alibaba, roll all of them together and give that fellow all their money. You still be what? You still be discontented. You still be discontented. So, verse 12. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, take note, someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. So, how do you compare the amount of money in the bank, the number of shares you have, number of houses, temporary, ephemeral, timid, flighty things with eternal spiritual riches of faith, love, joy, peace, favor, confidence that I know the God that I believe and that I serve, and above all, everlasting life in Christ Jesus. The kinds of riches that give you confidence to face temptation and not to be afraid and to say every time and any time, the prince of this world is coming, but what? He finds nothing in me. Say, I have no business with you. I have no business with you. God will help us in the name of Jesus. God always shows us that dependence on him is always far more profitable than dependence on mammon. And that the thing that you trust in can just glitch. Maybe just to teach. I was in India last week or the upper week. Contrary to my practice, I would pay my bills when I'm checking out of the hotel. Something just said pay. So I gave them my card and I paid for my room and whatever I was going to need. That was it. Then I needed to get something three days into my trip. The card did not work until I left. Until I left, the card did not work. I won't mention the name of the bank. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I just told myself, what, what big embarrassment. I was heading a country delegation and then he can't pay. He can't pay his bills. Simply because the card did what? It's just like trusting in the card. And the card decided to fail. God will help us in the name of Jesus. In Judas, in Judas, Jesus showed us an example that loving money and pretending to be in the ministry and actually hating God, it leads to no profit or gain at all. And it did not matter how long Judas pretended, eventually he was found out. The second character trait of Judas, he was an unbeliever. Now it's very difficult to accept the fact that one of the apostles Somebody who was the, in the inner circle of Jesus, who followed Jesus on all his journeys. Don't forget that wherever Jesus had to go to, Judas had to be there, even if some people dropped out. Because if he needed to pay for an inn or something, the, the treasurer has to be there. Is that not so? In some places, he would say, go and buy them food. Who will have the money? It's Judas now. It's Judas who would disburse the money. This man followed Jesus all over the place. 
He had all the sermons of Jesus. He saw the miracles of Jesus. He had the teachings of Jesus. And yet, nothing penetrated. For three years. For three years, nothing penetrated. So sometimes I didn't look at it. The same word, you know, just like Paul said in the book of Hebrews. Say the same gospel that was preached to them. Which they received and mixed with faith. Some other people received it, but because of a heart of stone, it did not penetrate. Recently, we arrested and prosecuted a reverend in one of the prominent churches. So my people seized his phone and whatever to aid our investigation. And before they got around to arresting and picking him up, very prominent denomination, if I mention the thing, the man had been looking for incantations. They were sending him incantations. Reverend, no. How will he walk? Is God not a God of justice? You have done all those things and then you go and recruit some. I always challenge them. I say, this is a good time to go and meet your spiritual consultant. You know they walk. You cannot walk. So when they showed, I was very surprised. I said, this man, and this is somebody who they put in one church for God knows how many years. He will give only communion to the people. He will pray for them. He will do marriage blessing. But yet, he was looking for it. I will fuck log walk ball. Those who can translate it into English should help me. <laughs> Nothing could be much more embarrassing than somebody who is so well positioned that other people are envying you. I mean, some people envied the 12 disciples because they were Jesus' inner caucus. Within that 12, you also have officers. And this man was an officer within the 12. Not just any ordinary office. An important officer. We cannot buy anything except... And you know people who hold money are always very important people. Is that not so? Treasurers are important people. You have to massage their ego. Otherwise, they cannot be available. They will not be available when you need them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When Jesus fed the multitude in John chapter 6, and the next day, they came back. Jesus said, eh, I'm sure you are back because you ate bread yesterday. Today, there's no bread. Only the word. Many of them started going. He said, the bread you should eat is my flesh. They said, uh, are you better than our father Abraham? Are we cannibals? Why are you offering us? So, the Bible says in John chapter 6, many of them left. Jesus then asked the 12, are you going to leave also? Peter, the leader of the group, did not allow anybody to answer. He said, Master, where shall we go? You have the word of life. We have come to realize that you have the word of life. We're staying with you. Bread or no bread. But Peter was speaking for 12 minus 1. He was not speaking for Judas, apparently. And Peter and the disciples did not know the character of Judas. And Jesus tried to tell him. When Jesus washed their feet, he said to Peter, he said, ah, Lord, are you washing my feet? He said, yes. He said, somebody who has bathed, who is clean, does not need washing except the feet. He said, but, I'm not talking about you. He said, but you are not all clean. You are not all clean. He tried to warn Peter that be careful of some of the people around you. When Peter spoke for the twelve, Lord, to whom shall we go? He was preemptive. He apparently spoke for himself and ten others, but not for Judas. In spite of all the pointers that Jesus had entered it, Judas continued with his plan. Before the Passover meal, just the example I gave you, you can check from John 13, 10 to 11. Where Jesus told Peter that you are not all clean. Somebody here, somebody here is not with us. I pray. Sometimes when you read, you think that, oh, what's the difference between Judas as an unbeliever and Thomas? Thomas was a doubter. He wanted to see, to believe. 
But Judas cannot claim that his art was completely not right. When Thomas finally saw and believed, Jesus told him, blessed are those who did not see, but do the what? But believed. When you have doubts, you just want validation. You are behaving like Gideon. They say you are going to lead the army. He say, eh, eh, okay, tomorrow morning, make sure that everything is wet except this place. I want to be sure that I am not dreaming. I need to pinch myself. Thomas was a doubter. He was not an unbeliever. But Judas was an unbeliever. The third character trait of Judas, which is the most popular, he was a traitor and a conspirator. This is what he was is most notorious for and for which we remember every Easter and indeed every day that somebody sold Jesus out. Jesus knew there was a traitor in the camp. So if you are a traitor in church, don't deceive yourself that God doesn't know about you. Jesus knew there was a traitor in the, in the place, in the congregation. And he indicated it. He gave warnings. He gave warnings. He said things that pointed at the person who wasn't doing right to do a self-check. But Judas did not take the hint. I pray that we will not fall into that category of vessels of dishonor in the name of Jesus. In John 13, 18 to 19, when Jesus entered that somebody close to him was a betrayer. John 13, 18 to 19, he said, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the passage of scripture. He who shared my bread. That's the one we read in Psalm number 69. Who shared my bread. Who sat on the table with me. Has betrayed me. Our biggest adversaries are often not strangers. To get someone you need an insider. The insider for Jesus was Judas Iscariot. To effectively betray someone, you need to get information about them. That's why sometimes I pray. The person who has information will not be able to give it. The one who can give it will not get it in the name of Jesus. Because for someone to effectively hurt you, they need to know who you are. They need to ask about you. What's the name? When was the person born? Who is his father or his mother? They are trying to get information to really get inside you. To know who you are. That's why Yorubas, Yorubas say a proverb. Biku leo bakpani. Who can finish it? If you have not been killed amongst your own people from inside, somebody inside has already killed you in their heart, in which case they are going to sell you out. How would they get you? Judas had already crucified Jesus in his heart. So he was willing to, to sell him out. And Jesus himself said, a man's enemy shall be who? Those of his household. So sometimes when we pray, we should realize that the people we are praying about and against, they are, not, they are not strangers, they are not foreigners. They are people we know. If we look closely, pray again, they will sleep. And when they sleep, we will discover that this person does not mean well for me. This person does not mean well for me. Our biggest adversaries are family, Friends, acquaintances, co-workers, business associates, people who ought to help us in our difficulty, but who choose not to help us because they know us. The Lord will deliver us from such in the name of Jesus. Some people have reasoned that Judas did not know what he was doing. You know, apart from the books you have in the Bible, you know there are some other Gospels. They have been kept out of the Bible in order not to confuse believers. One of those Gospels is the Gospel according to Judas. I have a copy. I've read it. There's also a Gospel according to Thomas. There's a Gospel according to Mary Magdalene. I have all three. I've read through them. Very apologetic in that he tries to make a case where there was no case. Two strong things that he tried to say. That Jesus wanted Judas to betray him because it was necessary to fulfill whatever plan Jesus had. If this was true, why did Jesus refer to him as son of perdition? And that it should have been better for the person. Jesus said in Matthew, offense will come into the world, but woe to the person through whom what? The offense comes. 
say it would have been better for the person not to be born. It's better to tie a millstone around their neck and go and drown them. So, that argument falls flat on his face. The second argument is that he was following instruction. If he was following instruction, why did he go and commit suicide after Jesus was so brutally executed? Because he felt regret. The Bible says he was remorseful. Don't forget that this Judas was the one who went to the chief priest. Matthew 26, 14 to 16. He saw an opportunity to make more money. People who can sell their own mothers. Matthew 26. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest. They didn't come to him. He went to them and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? For some people, everything is calculated in monetary terms. If they can make money from it, it is fair game. So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And in doing his plan, he wanted to do it in such a way that Jesus would not even know. When he was going to spotlight Jesus, how did he do it? With a convivial love, a kiss, with a hug. Ah, master, Raboni gave him a hug. And Jesus said, Judas, do you betray the son of man with a, with a kiss? He thought he was clever. But Jesus knew what he was planning. When people have already sold their souls to the devil, they are the ones who will be pretending to be your best friend. The ones Yoruba people called Amoni Sheni. And then those who don't know, they are the Afa Amoni Sheni. And there's those who do and come and commiserate with you. Asheni Bani. You will not fall into their hands in the name of Jesus. They are terrible character traits. The Lord will deliver us from their hands in the name of Jesus. Judas' presence with Jesus, the word of life himself, made no impact on him. What a tragedy. What a big, big tragedy. In the same way, today, the word of life is unheeded and ignored by modern day Judas, who for the love of money and their unbelief may end up in hell, except there is a divine turnaround. And their repentance is absolute and they trust in Jesus. This, one of the scriptures I read said Jesus prayed all night before he chose the twelve. Did he make a mistake? After holding a vigil, praying all night and then he selected twelve people. He didn't make a mistake. Somebody in that midst had to allow himself to be used for evil. You not allow yourself to be used for evil in the name of Jesus. If they say somebody here will betray the church and everybody has heard it, he's up. It won't be me. It won't be me. It won't be me. People can caution themselves and take heed. 2 Timothy 2.20 tells us that in a great house there are vessels of gold and silver, of wood and earth. Some for honor and some for what? Some for dishonor. When you know that wherever you are, you can, it's one of two things. You can either be for honorable things or dishonorable things. You remind yourself all the time. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Matthew 27, 3 to 5, as I begin to round up. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with what? Remorse. He was seized with remorse. And he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. And what did he say of himself? The next sentence. I can't hear you. He says, I have sinned. For I have done what? So, if Jesus was not innocent, what could he have been guilty of? He said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. But of course, his partners in crime who have achieved their nefarious objective and heartless, cold-blooded. They say, what's that to us? The job is done. We have achieved our objective. You can go to court. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> they told him, what, what's, how is that our problem? Very heartless. Say, that's your responsibility. 
So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And what did he do? He went to hang himself. You will not end up like Judas in the name of Jesus. I will not end up like Judas in the name of Jesus. This scripture suggests that after Judas was, Jesus was crucified, Judas came to his senses. And he realized for the first time the trajectory that he had been following. His remorse was, however, not repentance. In any event, he was too late. It was just mere regret. He was the proverbial son of perdition that Jesus referred to in his prayer for the disciples. Jesus prayed for the disciples in John 17. Say, all that you have given me, I have not lost any of them, except who? The son of perdition. So that the scriptures may be what? May be fulfilled. I pray that bad scripture will not be fulfilled over your life in the name of Jesus. Perdition means to be completely lost. Irredeemable. Unfortunately for Judas, his betrayer did not prevent Jesus from achieving his objective. In fact, what did his betrayal do? He helped Jesus achieve his objective. So, I always wonder when you are trying to stop or frustrate God's plan, everything that you do is actually in furtherance of that plan. So just continue. Everything, without exception, is in furtherance of that plan. The remorse of Judas was inconsequential. He fulfilled his destiny to betray Jesus. Even if he repented, it would not have taken him to heaven. And the reaction of the chief priest to his emotional anguish is typical of hard-hearted conspirators who have achieved their nefarious goals. Unfortunately, like Judas, many of us still betray and we sell Jesus out in contemporary times by our love of money, our unbelief, and treachery against the word of God and advice of God. If you say you are a Christian wherever you are, you can't blend. It's not possible. You can't blend. Once you blend, you should ask yourself, something is wrong. Because you, the world is go, driving in the wrong direction. So as a Christian... In that flow, you should be driving against traffic. There is no other way for me to put it. Jesus served in the inner circle of Jesus. He walked with the greatest teacher on earth. But he ended up in suicide. He was close to salvation, but yet lost eternity. I pray that that will not be your portion in the name of Jesus. So which of these Judas character traits do we have to give up? The unbridled love of money or something else, unbelief or betrayal. Let's bow our heads as we pray. If you have never given your life to Jesus, you are a Judas by excellence. If you like to commit your ways unto the Lord, say, Lord, Wherever you've positioned me, I don't want to be like Judas who betrayed you. Just raise your hand. We will pray together. If you are raising your hand, raise it and let me see it. We will pray together. Say, God, help me. You need to submit first to Jesus. You need to give up and come to him first before anything else. Before we pray about Stable character that ensures that he is not betrayed. If you are raising your hand, just raise it well so I can see it. Is there a hand at the back? Please, raise your hand well. If you are raising it. Begin to say, Lord, I want to commit and submit to you because I cannot help myself. For the rest of us who have already given our lives to Jesus, where and how have we been falling short and betrayed? I want you to pray for yourself. You love money too much. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. You love something too much. Something for which you will betray Jesus. You come to church, but yet you are unbelieving. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord and say, God help me. Ask for strength. Ask for grace. Ask that the Lord will bear us, especially at this time, 
on the world where those things which ordinarily everybody knows is wrong everybody understands that this is not right but all of a sudden even in the church among the elect let's pray and say lord help us help us to be true disciples of jesus indeed in words, in actions, in all that we do, so that we do not become Judas. In every way that God has placed us, that we do not betray Jesus, that we do not hang him again on the cross with our ways of life. Let's pray for our preacher this morning. Let's ask for strength. In the inner man to continue to drive against traffic even in the midst of the work that he does let's pray for strength for him let's ask that the lord will continue to give grace unto him to do according to his will let's pray that i will continue to hear the voice of the lord in the midst of the noise. Father, we thank you this morning for your word that has come to us. Lord, we are pleading with you that no matter what the curb, men will continue to press upon our lips. May we not fall for it in the name of Jesus. Lord, give us strength to stand out in every area, every position, every place that you have put us. Strength to stand out and stand for you in the name of Jesus. May we not betray you with our lives, our ways, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, mighty God. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed.